welcome to the brand new sermon series, our summer sermon series on Joseph this morning. And we're so glad that you're here. I want to begin the message with some very famous words. Words are, I have a dream. I have a dream. Famous, powerful words, right? Those words were spoken eight times in an address that Martin Luther King Jr. gave on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. in August of uh, 1963 to a crowd of about 20, uh, 250,000 people and that were there uh, in a, to support the civil rights movement. And he shared those words to help cast a vision, to help share the dream, the dreams of freedom, dreams of a better America, dreams of equality for all people. And those words, even so many years removed now, still hold such power in casting vision, casting dreams against racism, even around the world. I want to talk this morning about having dreams. I want to talk today about having not just any kind of dream, but having God-sized dreams. Life-changing kind of dreams, the kind of dreams that, that save lives, that make a difference in our world. You know, as children, we all have dreams as kids. You know, we start off, we, we have dreams of becoming something great in our future, right? Some of you fulfilled those dreams. You had dreams of becoming a doctor. You had dreams of becoming an astronaut. Any astronauts in the room? Um, and, you know, uh, you had dreams of maybe becoming a fireman or like me. Uh, I either wanted to become Captain Kirk or a Disney animator because I love to draw. And, uh, but back in those days, you had to draw, you know, 50 drawings to make a hand go up like this. And so once I realized I had to do the same drawing over and over again, so I put that dream aside. <laughs> We've, we form these dreams. You may have dreamed of, uh, you know, your perfect wedding day. Some of you have that dream or have lived that dream, right? Um, or scoring the winning touchdown in the big game. We have dreams of, you know, maybe performing. You've got a, a talent that you want to perform before thousands of people. But somewhere along the lines, sometimes dreams go to the, to the side, don't they? Sometimes we even stop dreaming about things because the realities of life take place. And, you know, safety and security, they start to take a higher priority than the risk of adventure. And this morning, I just want to ask you, if you would, just for the next few minutes in this talk, if you would consider dreaming again. Consider Asking God to give you dreams again. And perhaps even the desires that God has planted already in your heart have been planted there by Him because He wants to do something great through you. So I want to ask you today, consider, consider dreaming again. Consider having dreams that are not just for your glory, but for the glory of God. Consider asking God today, by the end of today, if he will fill you with new dreams that will bring him glory, maybe dreams to feed the hungry, maybe the dreams to launch a new business for his glory, maybe the dreams to lead a group of people and help them take their next steps of Christ or to help the needy in some way in our, in our community or around the world, or just to create something beautiful that will bring glory to God. But a God-sized dream that will pour Jesus into the world. Would you just consider that this morning as we go through our talk here today? Because I've, I've come to tell you that it's not too late to dream. And we want to talk about this. We're starting this new series, and we're going to be going into the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 37. It's kind of where the story of Joseph uh, begins. And it's a famous story. It's a popular story. You know, I think largely in the world, outside of the church world, it's been made popular by Andrew Lloyd Webber's. You know, famous uh, a musical, you know, Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat. But there's been lots of movies made about the story of Joseph, and one of my favorites is the DreamWorks 
made a movie. It was a sequel to their Prince of Egypt, the Moses story, and they called it The King of Dreams. If you haven't seen it, and I recommend it, it's a great retelling of the, the story of Joseph and uh, with powerful songs in it. Amazing story. It's an amazing story, though. Just the story of Joseph is amazing, and it's really worth retelling. It's one of those stories that is inspirational. And so it's no wonder that it's been retold in so many different ways. It's a story about a, a guy against all odds who's able to faithfully face adversity, face hardship, face testing, and yet he sees his dream fulfilled. You know, our culture, our culture values dreams. They have a different perspective on it. They, they look at dreams in a more uh, selfish way type of way, and kind of the idea of having your wishes fulfilled, the, that, that type of idea, you know, the, 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 a fantasy fulfilled or your heart's desire coming possible, you know, following your dream to LA to become a uh, famous movie star, that type of idea. But I want to suggest to you today that based on the story of Joseph, that we consider having dreams that are not just about us, but having dreams that are about bringing the glory of God to others, about ministering to others, seeing God glorified as we minister. And I believe throughout the series, we're going to be challenged that modern day Josephs are prepared through adversity. And even though evil comes against them, they see God turn what was meant for evil and turn it for their good. And through the adversity, they are proved. They are, they are brought into to God's, to God's will and, and God's power is seen through their lives. And God's word is shown true. And so through these adversities, God is really glorified in this. And his kingdom is glorified and take, take it further. So I ask us today, if, we consider as we go through the message today it's asking God to use you his kingdom to give you a dream turn to Genesis chapter 37 with me this morning let's read we'll start at verse 2 it says this is the account of Jacob and his family when Joseph was 17 years old he often tended his father's flocks. He worked with his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Belha and Selpa. And Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things that his brothers were doing. Now Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph was born to him in his old age. So one of Jacob's uh, so one day Jacob had a special gift made for for Joseph a beautiful robe But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them They couldn't even say a kind word to him And one night Joseph had a dream and when he told his brothers about it They hated him even more Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the fields, tying up bundles of grain, when suddenly the bundles, my bundles stood up, and your bundles gathered around and bowed down low before mine. His brothers responded, So you think you're going to be king? Our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. And soon Joseph had another dream. And again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars bowed down before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as his brothers. But his father, father scolded him. What kind of dream is that? He asked. 
Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered, some verses might say pondered, what the dream meant. So, this story of Joseph, we can kind of see why so many have made plays and, and made television shows and movies about it. It's, it's just made for TV. You know, it's, it's got, the way it's even set up in the, in the scriptures is in like chapters or in episodes of Joseph's life. And so in the, the telling of it, we even in this first chapter of Joseph's life, we have two scenes and we just read the first scene of his life. And so it kind of has these different scenes and, and chapters throughout it. And in this first scene, like any good uh, story, they really introduce the characters to you. And so we're told that in the first scene, this is about Jacob and his family. In the very first verse. And Jacob is a patriarch of Israel. He's the son of Isaac and Rebekah. And he's the grandson of Abraham and Sarah. And uh, he's the brother of Esau. Actually, he's the twin brother, but the younger of the two. He's the twin. And, and the Bible talks about them and their relationship together. But it says even before they were born, that they fought together in their mother's womb. And that when they were born, Esau came out first, but Jacob came out grasping the heel of his older brother. And this, his name is actually Heel Grasper, Jacob. And the two of them looked very different and had very different natures. And as they grew up, the Bible actually tells us that in his family, in Jacob's family, that his father, Isaac, loved Esau more than he loved Jacob. But his mother loved Jacob more. And Jacob, and you know, there was this tension between the two of them because of, uh, of these relationships and this family dynamic. And one day, the Bible tells us that Jacob got Esau at a very vulnerable time. And he got him to sell his birthright to him for a bowl of stew. And then later on, as her father was about to die, with the help of his mother, he tricked his father into blessing him over his brother Esau. And because of this, Esau hated Jacob. He hated his brother Jacob so much that he said he was going to kill him as soon as their father died. And so Jacob had to flee. And he went to live with his uncle where he fell in love with Rachel. And he wanted to marry Rachel. And so he made a deal with his uncle to marry Rachel. He would work for seven years, but got a taste of his own medicine and his uncle tricked him into marrying his, Rachel's older sister Leah and so he marries Leah and realizes he's been tricked and he works another seven years to marry the one he really wanted to marry Rachel and so now Joseph ends up with two wives one he wanted to marry the one he was tricked into marrying. And the Bible tells us that Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. And Leah actually felt hated. But God opened Leah's womb and she quickly gave birth to four sons. Fairly rapidly, so he couldn't have hated her that much, right? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. And well, next slide will show you the different sons that they had. He gave birth to four sons. And so Rachel was barren. And, and, and she so desperately wanted to raise a son for Jacob that she gave her maid servant, Belha, to uh, Jacob. And Jacob married her. And she gave birth to two sons. 
And then Leah, the wife that he didn't uh, want to marry, she became temporarily barren. And so she gave her maidservant to Jacob, Selpah, and he married her. And she gave birth to two sons. It starts to feel like a, a little bit of a crazy competition there, doesn't it? Yeah, I agree. But then Leah became fertile again, and she gave birth to two more sons and a daughter. And then the Bible tells us when Jacob was very old, his favorite wife, Rachel, gave birth to Joseph, who we're going to be talking about. And so Jacob had a favorite, he was the favorite of his mother, but not his father. And he openly had a favorite wife. And guys, if you have a favorite wife, make sure she's your only wife. Okay? Like, that's a tip there. And, you know, and then he openly has a favorite son. In, this, in fact, he, he extravagantly shows to everyone in his family, all these other children, that Jacob is his favorite. Now, I kind of understand this. Okay, your parents kind of you know, go with me here. Uh, you know, I am the favorite child of my parents, <laughs> right? And, and so I can understand that. And my brother, he's, he's nine and a half years younger than me, and he's so cute. He thinks he's the favorite, <laughs> right? But you know what? I know it. But see, my parents, you know, they do their best not to rub that in. You know, they don't, they don't make a big deal out of it, even though I know it, right? And, and you know, my, my kids would say the same thing. My kids would think they're their father's favorite, but I don't extravagantly make a difference between them. And so the brothers hated Joseph because of this. They hated him. And in fact, the second scene, where it takes place out in the fields, as you continue to read on in this chapter, you actually see that when they were given the opportunity, they wanted to kill Joseph. They wanted to kill Joseph. And in verse 20, they, you see that they actually make a plan to kill him. And they, they throw him in a pit. And figure he will die there. But some traders come along, some, some merchants who are going to Egypt to sell things. And they instead, they sell Joseph to him as a slave for 20 pieces of silver. Then they go back to their father and they deceive their father into thinking that Joseph was killed by a wild animal. Can you see that? This is one dysfunctional family. Yeah, can you, you mean, turn to your neighbor and say, that's dysfunctional. I mean, that is crazy, right? Um, and so you're probably by this time saying, so, so pastor, why? Why do you spend so much time and build this chart to show us and talk about this dysfunctional family? Why would you do that this morning? We're talking about dreams this morning. And as I read that chapter through over and over in preparation to speak this morning, Holy Spirit just continued to remind me of how many people I have talked to who either in their words or their actions have said to me, I can't have a dream because of the, the home I was brought up in. I can't have a dream because of the issues that I've had to face. You said, Pastor, you don't know the dysfunction that has been in my family. And I can't do something great for God. God can never use me to do something great because there's so much dysfunction. And I just felt to come and to tell you this morning that God's grace is greater. The grace of God is greater than any dysfunction that has happened in your family. The grace of God is, is greater than the family that you were born in. The grace of God is greater than a family, mother or father, who may have abandoned you when you were a young age. The grace of God is greater than perhaps the situation of a parent who didn't abandon you physically, but abandoned you emotionally. The grace of God is greater than that. The grace of God is greater than a failed marriage or a failed relationship. And the grace of God is greater 
than those who would hate you, who would abuse you, who would toss you into a pit, or even sell you out for their own profit. The grace of God is greater than your life's issues this morning. See, Joseph had a family that was filled with dysfunction. But God still desired to use Joseph. And God gave Joseph a dream, even in the midst of a dysfunctional family. A spoil alert, if you've never read the story, you might want to cover your ears at this point. Spoil alert, his brothers, in verse 20, throw him into a pit. And here are the words they say to Joseph. They say, we'll see what becomes of his dreams. We will see what becomes of his dreams. Little did they know they're kind of speaking prophetically because one day they will see what became of Joseph's dreams. And they will see that God intended to use Joseph to bless a nation of people and to bless his own family and to save them from certain death. That God had a great dream for Joseph and wanted to bless many through him. Do you see where I'm going this morning? Are you hearing me this morning? It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter your family. God can still use you, no matter what the issues you're facing. Be open to what God wants to do in your life. So proud of our youth. They had a great service on, on uh, Friday night, and I, I showed up just to, to be a blessing, but I was so blessed. They, uh, they did their service outside on Friday night, set up the band set up out there, and they set up chairs and, and a sound system, and they were worshiping Jesus, and they were gathered around, worship team around the altar, and they were worshiping Jesus, and people were driving by and rolling down their windows to hear, and people were walking by and stopping to listen, and I saw one guy who actually stayed for the whole service at the fence. Just powerful people coming out on their balconies, their buildings, and to listen. Powerful, powerful service. And, uh, they sang some songs that just really ministered to me. I asked them to sing one of them at the end of our service today. And at one point, they, they have an events team. The events team decided that they would do a, a game. And, uh, and for them, it was just a game, but to me, it was speaking powerfully, prophetically to me. You see, in this game, it was one-legged dodgeball. And what they had to do is they had to get this bandana and so they tied their legs with bandanas. They had these bandanas. And they tied them around their legs so that uh, uh, they, could only, they could only jump around like this, right? And, and, and it, would, it, it caused them to be uh, demobilized in some ways. And they couldn't move freely. You know, they were, they were tied up. And, and, and as they're doing, they're just having fun. But, the, but God's speaking to me as they do this. I mean, they, God was speaking to me in their worship time. They, they sang a song, this beautiful song that says, I want to know your heart, God. And, and my heart was just going, oh, Lord, yes. Let these young people know your heart, God. And I asked the, the, the team if they'd lead us in that at the end. But even during their game, God is speaking to me. And, and they have no idea. They're just having fun. And, I, and I'm thinking, God, you know, some of us are tied up like this. And our mobility for you is all tied up. And, and after the game, they, some of them couldn't get their bandanas off. And they just kind of slipped them off their, their feet. And, and, and they gave them and said, you know, here's, here's my bandana. It's all tied up in knots. You know, some of us, our lives are like these bandanas. They're all tied up in knots because we have our past is, is, is so dysfunctional. The things that happen in our lives. And, and it was hard. Some of them, because they had jumped around them. These knots were tight. And me and a couple of other leaders, we, we were like trying to get the knots out. We were really, really, really working at them. And, 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 and it, was, it was tough. But we wanted to reuse these bandanas because they use them for lots of their games and stuff. And so we, we worked at it. And I, and I thought, you know, that's what God is doing in our lives. He's, we, he's working out the knots so that we can be used again. And that's what God wants to do, but he doesn't wait until everything is out. He's still got to call. Christine, you can finish that one for me. Thank you. <laughs> Praise God. God is working out. And in the midst of our dysfunction, God gives Joseph this gift. 
this dream. That's where I want to go. My second point is that gifts of God are a product of God's grace. And God doesn't look at you and say, you know what, no, you've got too many things wrong going on, and I don't give you any gifts. No, the Bible tells us that all of us are given gifts. They are a product of God's grace. That's my second point. The Bible tells us that He gives various gifts to us. So we all have gifts. And each of us are, are given these gifts. And they're given to us, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, to serve one another. And we are to be good stewards of the various gifts that God gives us. Now here's some things that I've learned about gifts. There, there are some dangers about gifts that we need to be aware of. See, not all gifts are the same. And sometimes there's a danger of us not even recognizing that we have a gift. That we have a, that God has given us a gift and that's to be used to bless others for his glory. And you've got a gift and you don't even recognize that you have it. That's dangerous because God wants you to use it. And, and so you might have a gift, say, of hospitality. And you don't even recognize that that's a gift from God. That not all of us have that gift. And God wants to use that gift to be a blessing to others. And so there's a danger in us not realizing that we have a gift. Now, there's other gifts that are very obvious. We all know, you know, we can see someone up on stage and know that they have a gift. And the reason that gift can be sometimes dangerous is because it's very recognizable. And instead of giving glory to God, there's a dangerous in us keeping the glory for ourselves rather than God being glorified through our gift. That we operate in a way that, that the gift is not bringing glory to God, but we're, we're taking the glory for ourselves. The most important thing I think about gifts is that, that, we, that, we, just, that we use the gift to be a blessing to others. <coughs> and one thing I discovered is the fact that a person has a gift. There's no guarantee that they're going to use it in the right way. So the most important thing is that we use it the right way. That we use it with wisdom and with maturity. We use it well. In fact, often this happens that uh, in, in the body of Christ, that God has given a gift and it's not used properly. And it's interesting that it's a characteristic of God's grace that he, even though we mess up with the gift that he's given us, he doesn't take it back. He doesn't say, oh, you messed up. You didn't use that gift the way I wanted you to use that gift. Now I'm going to take that gift from you. No. God wants us to grow in that. And even when we mess up, he still has given us the gift to us imperfect people. And, and gifts themselves are not a mark of spiritual maturity. It's how we use those gifts. It's the wise and generous use of them that demonstrates whether we are walking godly or not as believers. See, Joseph had a dream. God had given him this gift of a dream to be able to, to, to see the future. And, and later, he, we see that he's got the gift of interpreting dreams. And the first dream he has is these bundles of grain in the field and, and, his, and with his brothers and his brothers bundles bow down to his. But God never told him to share that dream. God had given it to him. He didn't tell him to share it. In fact, the Bible says it was the way he shared that dream with his brothers. So we're led to think that maybe, you know, he shared that goatingly. You know, saying, look how great God, you know, I am special. Here's why I had this dream. Or at least maybe he, he knew that they already didn't like him that, that because of his father's favoritism and this beautiful coat. That maybe this wasn't the right thing to share with your brothers. At this, that the outcome is not really surprising that in the Bible it says his brothers hated him. And then it says they hated him even more in verse 8. There's this mounting intensity of hatred towards Joseph. And then we see that, okay, Joseph didn't, wasn't really a quick learner at, 
at this young age. And he has a second dream, and he still shares it with his brothers again. But this time he shares it with his father, who rebukes him, which had to be a, a kind of a, a strange thing for Joseph, who was treated like such a favorite. I'm sure he didn't get a lot of rebuking. But this time his father rebukes him, probably for the way he was sharing it, or that he even you know, was sharing it, and, and then... But his father was wise enough to ponder and say, I wonder, is God trying to speak to us? Many of you remember Mary pondering when she was told of the promises. So here Joseph ponders, thinking maybe, you know, there's something to this. And so scene one of our story actually ends with Jacob the same way it began. And it's a good reminder to us that the story of Joseph is just not about Joseph alone. But it's about Jacob's family. It's about the people of God and God preparing and saving them from a, a future famine. About God being a blessing through Joseph. And I think sometimes we are tempted to think that the gifts and the dreams that God gives us must be just for us. If it comes to me, well, then it must be for me, right? But maybe we need to rethink. Think that if God has given us a gift, that he wants to be used for his glory, to bless others, and that others might, might praise God and see the glory of God and glorify his name because of the gift God has given us. Which brings me to my last point, and the uh, worship team's going to come play that song in a moment for us, we can begin to come. But as children of God, we need to remember that the glory of God is what matters. And we should have, of all the people in the world, we should have big dreams. We should have God-sized dreams that will bring glory to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us that whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. See, that's been the plan throughout history. The plan throughout scriptures has always been, right from the beginning, was to bring glory to God. God wants to bring glory to himself. And that's a stretch for us. It's a change for us because in a, our culture, it's all about indulging ourselves. We're fed with commercials and billboards and everything, talking about how to do things for ourselves and indulge ourselves in living the good life. And when I say live the dream as a title, that's kind of what first comes to our minds because it's what we've been trained. We don't think that living the dream is actually about being used by God to bless others. We think about all the blessings for ourselves. But as Christians, we are told that we, Christ, Christians, are to identify with Christ. And in Philippians chapter 2, there verse 5, it says that we must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. That though he was God, he did not think of himself equal with God as something that he could cling on to. Instead, he gave up his privileges. He humbled himself to the position of being nailed on a cross between two criminals. He did all this that he could redeem many. But ultimately, verse 11 tells us, he did all that to glorify God the Father. To glorify God. God wants to use you this morning to glorify himself. The story of Joseph is a reminder to us that God can use anyone. Doesn't matter what circumstances you're born in, doesn't matter the issues that you're facing in your life today, God can use you. He wants to use you to bring glory to himself.
to be a blessing to others. And it's not too late. It's not too late for you and I to dream again. For us to rise up and to say, I have a dream. I have a dream. We're touching this world, bringing glory to God. So I started this message this morning by asking you, would you just consider asking God to give you a dream? Or to rekindle a dream that once was there but has gone to the, the wayside. A God-sized dream that will pour Jesus into our world. Because we have a world that is waiting. We have a world that is waiting to see the glory of God. They're waiting for the children of God to rise up, to live bigger, to take risks because of the love of the Father. To love greater. And to move forward even despite our own fears, but to move forward in faith. That God might be glorified in greater ways. You give yourself permission this morning just to dream again. Just stand this morning. We're going to lead us in that song that just ministered to my heart and the youth sang the other night. And then I want to pray for us. But you take this moment just to ask God to fill you with God's sized dreams. my life right with God and, and, and so that he can bring glory to himself through me and I just need to know him more. This morning I want to pray for you this morning. If that's you, would you just raise your hand this morning? If that's you here this morning. Just, yeah, yeah, I see that hand. That hand. That hand back there. A number of hands up going up. Yes, all over the place. I'll pray for you this morning and what you need to do is just with a heart of gratitude just say, God, I want to I want to know you more and and, and give your heart to him this morning and, and we'd love to help you take those next steps as a church and so we'd love to meet with you after and, and to pray with you one on one and, and perhaps tell the person that you came with that you know what I just want to make my life right with God and I'm making a change today but for all of us today too I, I want to pray for all of us because I believe God is, it, it wants to raise up his people to have God sized dreams big dreams that God would use us 
is individually and us as a church that we would have a, a, a dream and we've got to, I mean we as a church here you're standing in part of our dream right now and the rest of it there's two more stages that we've got dreams for to be built out and eventually this area will be all dedicated to, to, to serving our community and youth clubs and community clubs and, and we won't be having church in here that's part of our dream and that's part of why I'm part of this church is because there's a dream for a God sized dream for the future God, for each of us, has a dream, wants to place a dream in our hearts to use us for His glory. This morning, just I hope I see every hand. How many want to be used for the glory of God? You want to have a dream? Yeah, all across. Thank you, Lord. Let's just pray together. Jesus, thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, that you're placing dreams in our hearts. Some of us have put those dreams to the side because, Lord, life got busy, life got hard. And, God, I just pray you rebirth those dreams, Lord, afresh and anew for your glory. Oh, God, that you would stir it up within us, oh, God, that we could be used by you, that you can use us even in our brokenness, oh, God, that you can, you can rise up your glory for your glory alone, oh, God. Father, I pray that you begin to... to Give us enthusiasm for the dream, Lord. Begin to stir our hearts that nothing will stop us. Nothing will stop us. Nothing will hold us back. No matter adversities that we go through. No matter the trials that we go through, oh God. But Lord, that we are pressed through for the dream. To see the dream fulfilled, oh God. For your glory, Lord. That many might be saved. Just as Jesus endured the cross. We endure all things, oh Lord, to bring you glory. Father, I pray right now for your people today, oh God, that you help us to press forward towards bringing you glory in our lives. Lord, I pray you breath even fresh new dreams amongst us, that the gifts you have given us would not lay dormant, oh God but would be used for the glory of God. And right now, Lord, begin to stir up, begin to stir up, I pray, Lord, new dreams, new visions of the future, oh God. Lord, that you would just touch lives, Lord. Begin to stir them up, begin to raise them up. May we be waking in the middle of the night with a dream of what we can do for the kingdom of God, Lord. Lord, just begin to do that in our lives, not, not for our glory, oh God, but because in these days, people need to see the glory of God like they've never seen it before. So raise up artists to do wonderful things to bring glory for you. Raise up those with gifts of, of love and, and care and, 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 and Lord, that you would use them to care and to love and to help those in need, Lord. Raise up a generation, Lord, that will know your hearts and will pour out a blessing. Lord, you know, those that you're actually speaking to today, they say, you know what? Yeah, my life hasn't been quite right with the Lord, and I need to make my life right with you. And right here, you see the sincerity of their hearts. I thank you for their honesty today, for their sincerity today. And Lord, as they commit themselves to you, O oh Lord, you meet them right where they're at. Lord, you're not asking them to come way over here in order to and be so good that in order to earn your salvation. No, Lord, you've met them right where they're standing right today. You've come to them today. And Lord, you've met with them, you've moved on their hearts, and they've reached out to touch your hand today. So Lord, help them now to, to continue to grow in you and take their next steps and guide us as a church to help them, Lord. And Lord, that you would use them to do mighty things for your name's sake. In the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. If you're a guest with us, we'd love to get to know you. And so please come over and grab one of the, the, the gifts that we have for you and uh, introduce yourself to us. And we won't keep you long. we just like to, to say hi to you this morning. And if you want someone else to pray with this morning, we're here for you as well. Bless you.